All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Dave Bader, and I'm the Director of Education here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, and I really want to be thank uh, I'm thankful for all of your attendance tonight at our, our lecture. Before we get started, I just want to remind everybody, um, if you have a cell phone that's turned on right now, if you can mute it, turn it off, uh, we'd appreciate that for the, for the rest of the lecture. Also, I want to remind you that we are live streaming as well, so we have the audience that's out here, in our, uh, you guys, uh, and then we also have our, our virtual audience. Um, so uh, today, later on, when we ask questions, we'll have the microphone so that the, uh, the people in the, in the virtual community can hear the questions and answers as well. Um, we also want to make sure that we thank our, our sponsors, the Gazette New Newspapers and Courtyard Marriott, uh, for making this happen. They help us to bring this uh, amazing lecture series that we have. Um, to the Aquarium of the Pacific. And tonight I'm pleased to welcome uh, John Frazier, who's going to discuss uh, the roles and opportunities that zoos and aquariums can play in advancing a conservation ethos and how public trust offers opportunities for increased conservation action. Uh, Frazier is the president and CEO of New Knowledge, a social, uh, social science think tank aimed at building healthy democracy in a thriving biosphere. Uh, John is a Conservation psychologist, architect, and educator, Fraser's research focuses on how our experience with media and community influences learning, attitudes, and motivations for engagement with solving the problems that face society. He has led research on behalf of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums uh, under the Why Zoos and Aquariums Matter effort since 2005, and is a member of AZA's Research and Technology Committee. Frazier currently holds appointments as adjunct professor in earth science at Indiana University's Center for Urban Public Health, uh, editor of Curator, the Museum Journal, and a founding editorial board member for Museums and Social Issues. He is president-elect uh, president of the American Psychological Association's Division 34, Society for Environment, Population and Conservation Psychology, and a Media Impact Fellow at the Norman Lear Center, Annenberg School for, uh, jur of Journalism and Communication at the University of Southern California as well. So, uh, you know, Johnny, you obviously keep busy uh, with all of your titles and appointments. And right after this, uh, you were talking that you're headed up to San Francisco, I think, to go from president-elect to become president of said psychological uh, thing. <laughs> now that I look past all of this. So please welcome uh, Johnny Frazier. Thanks, Dave. Um, just, OK, good. There we are. Um, thanks, everybody. I, apparently, I have this career of searching for the longest titles. Um, so I apologize for that. But um, I'm just getting to know my, my little screen here. Uh, we're talking about conservation momentum today. Uh, thank you, Dave, Aquarium of the Pacific, everybody for being here, and those of you that are at, at home online. I really appreciate when an aquarium asks us what we're doing with conservation. Um, I think it's always useful to give you a little bit of backstory on where I'm from. So I worked at the Bronx Zoo for a while, and uh, we did a study on map making, uh, just to see if people could understand maps. And you'll notice we didn't use blue which I know is antithetical to being in an aquarium, but we decided to just try random colors and ask people if they could identify this map. And uh, we didn't get some great numbers. Um, we gave people this continent structure, and people did a lot better. Um, that's kind of your average American audience. So I just thought I should sort of orient you to where I'm from. You're going to notice my accent. I am Canadian. I was born just, just south of the California border, officially. Uh, in, in a place called Hamilton, Ontario, which is in Lake Ontario. Um, so we have our own little ocean experience, but it's a town like this. I, I grew up, we were talking just before I came out here about people's experiences with zoos and aquariums growing up, and is that how you ended up working in one? And not really, not for me. Um, I was a, a rower. I used to run through this area. That's where I, I ran. That's kind of the neighborhood I grew up, but I also spent weekends at my uncle's farm and got to know a whole bunch of these guys. Um, they're actually kind of, they're really cuddly. It's hard to, for people that haven't grown up on a farm. Heifers are, are actually kind of, they just like to cuddle. And so I spent a lot of time with them. But my real career started as an architect. I worked for uh, an organization called British Airports. Again, I'm coming to a big blue building, so I thought I should look at blue buildings I worked on. So as an architect, I worked on airports and worked on big condominium developments, things like that. But I found myself being asked to work at the uh, 
Toronto Zoo on an orangutan building. And I realized that all of that farm experience that I had as a kid came back to thinking about, you know, what is it our purpose really is? And it was really more fulfilling for me to work on projects that had some meaning or, or value to them rather than uh, a project that was really about transportation and keeping air inside the building or outside the building. So I got really excited about what is the purpose of a zoo, how does it fulfill its purpose, what is its mission. Uh, and that sort of changed my career from architecture, moving, it wasn't really quick, it was really slow, but suddenly I found myself working as a psychologist at the Bronx Zoo and doing studies on what really is happening in our conservation mission. Are we pursuing a mission that is going to change the way people consume the natural resources on which all life depends? So I was fortunate in my career to be offered some of these opportunities and introduced this idea of conservation psychology. Now, conservation psychology is a meta-discipline, and it came up around 2001. A group, of, a group of us were sitting around talking about conservation biology. Formed in 1980s as a crisis discipline, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that if you're even here, uh, but conservation biology is still fairly new in our history. The idea that you would organize all of these types of science under one big umbrella, something that's a big tent that could actually help us think about an overall mission or outcome. And so this comes from the 1980s. Um, a fellow named Michael Soule first sort of pursued this idea in detail, and it became a society. But around 2001, we suggested that we should be looking at the social sciences with an equal level of concern, that conservation psychology could start to draw from some of the studies that are going on in terms of how people grow, how they develop, ways that they're thinking about social interaction. If we really want a conservation-minded society, then we're really talking about changing the system conditions around how people think about the environment, not just what we're documenting in terms of its degradation or what can be done to fix it. So we suggested this meta-discipline. Now, the other field that I've been working in, because I've been in zoos, is really a subset of museums. And there's another fellow that I like to refer to. This was the deputy director of the Hirshhorn uh, and eventually part of the Smithsonian Institution, Steve Wheel. And Steve uh, really got into asking the question, what is the purpose of a museum in society? Now, historically, it's a nice little story. The American museum is a different kind of movement than the European tradition. We often hark back to a British model where people collected a whole bunch of stuff but the museum model in America actually starts during the Revolution. When the Standing Army was established by Congress, the Standing Army realized that there was no thing known as formal school system. People were learning by living and growing up on farms, working with others, and there were universities, but there wasn't really a public school system. So how could we have soldiers that defend democracy if they're not learning about democracy? So each army base in the United States and those around the world have a museum dedicated to the idea that if a soldier doesn't understand democracy, then how can they defend it? So that idea of the museum is really part of our democratic process, and the idea that it's a learning tool predates the formal school system. But Steve suggested back in around the late, 90, late 90s, early 2000s, that you can define museums by their purpose, by their capabilities, by their effectiveness, and their efficiency. And he suggested this because he said, if you're not sort of simplifying your model beyond the mission into looking at how much you do and how well you do it, your efficiencies are irrelevant. He was actually thinking in a counterpoint to what had been happening with us looking at efficiencies in a lot of evaluation. We kept looking at, are we doing it efficiently on budget, how many people, instead of do we even have the possibility of doing it. So what I'm hoping to do today is talk, and this is here, right? So I wanted to, I grabbed your picture off the internet, so I broke your copyright, sorry about that. Um, but, you know, I wanna talk a little bit about not the efficiency, but the capabilities and effectiveness, because I think we've all agreed that the purpose that we're here for is conservation of the natural world on which we all depend. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about capability and start with a really fun one because we talk a lot about zoos and aquariums, and my work has crossed zoos and aquariums. They share a lot. They have a lot in common, but they are quite different. The aquarium is actually becoming a really interesting metaphor. We know this one, it's a zoo in here, right? 
The zoo is this idea of chaos. Oops, sorry, I went too fast. Uh, the, the zoo is an idea of suppressed chaos as a metaphor. When we talk about it, it's about an artificial imposition on a natural order where all things will eat each other, each other if we let them loose. And so a zoo is used as metaphor to mean a control of chaos. The aquarium, however, is being treated as an information gathering thing. It's starting to be used as a metaphor for the internet. <laughs> um, and I love that it's, it allows users to explore a large corpus at any level of granularity. It's this idea of thinking big and small. Now this is very consistent with the research we've been doing on the distinction between zoos and aquariums. Zoos are held to the collection. If you've got elephants, you can tell me about elephants. If you've got Cotamundi, you can tell me about Cotamundi. Please don't tell me about Cotamundi if you have elephants but no Cotamundi. But an aquarium is like operating a place where you get to talk about everything under the big blue carpet. Um, and so here's another term I love. This is from Peer Review Journal, fishification. Okay, it, it's actually about taking activity streams and looking at how people fish in the aquarium that is the internet. So the aquarium is known in our, is becoming known in our society as the model of how we think about vast amounts of stuff that we can dig into and step back from. So it's exciting because that is more convergent to the way we think about conservation than what we see in zoos. My magic button does its thing. There it goes. So the zoo, sorry, this is my joke. My joke just landed low. Um, right, the zoo model is this idea of control. There's always a control system in place that keeps the natural chaos from getting out of, out of control and becoming you know, untrammeled mess. Whereas the aquarium is this place where you can inquire about every possible detail and think differently about contrast and variation. So today I promised I would talk about the Why Zoos and Aquarium Matter studies. Our work starts around 2001. I was not a founder of this project. I came into the project as an advisor and then moved into working on one of the initiatives around 2005. This is a coordinated effort through the zoo and aquarium community to understand what the unique social purpose is that zoos and aquariums can fulfill in relation to what people expect or don't expect from our zoos and aquariums. We deal with topics like, do we trust? Do we know what's going on? How do different groups and communities think about it? And over the last, well, 13 years at this point, we've been able to dig into a lot of the detail that's happening in terms of people's minds and the way zoos and aquariums work. But we are talking about conservation. So, okay, this is, the, this is the really fast set of slides, by the way, that I'm going through here. So when we look at the history of conservation in the arts, there has been a tradition in poetry, in a lot of the artwork that we see about conservation, um, that has to do with the lament, the loss, the elegy, the sense that there is a destruction of the systems that we depend on. Um, this concept of smashing and breaking goes back to the idea of an order, a natural order or system that was put in place that is being destroyed by the fallacies of people. It's been a story that's just a real downer. And so when you tell people what you work in, the first thing they say is usually not, boy, I'm having a party next week. Want to come and chat with people? Because we're really no fun at parties. In fact, this has been some of my research in the trauma psychology field, we've been looking at um, how does it feel to work in this environmental conservation field? And what we know when we talk to people working in environmental education, in conservation, in field research, consistently from our international studies, and these studies have involved a few thousand people, is that this is a persistent stress that is actually debilitating. We've been able to map some of the sy symptoms, in fact, most of the symptoms that we see in post-traumatic stress disorder also accrue to people who are working in conservation. I know, sorry, bit of a downer for all of you that are in here. The good news is that people who have strong social support at home or in their workplace, a regular sense of affinity 
with others who are going through the same struggle and feel that pain, don't have the level of symptoms that we see for people who are working in field research who tend to be isolated or working in communities where their values are disrespected. So although we're able to map the symptoms, I can say that it's not like everybody in here is experiencing the same thing that we see from people who are coming back from a war theater. What is challenging about this diagnosis, though, is that when we look at the clinical psychology recommendation, a couple things that get recommended for people coming back from, the, from deployment in war is that nature-assisted therapy is actually really great. You can take somebody who is a soldier and take them out to a forest, and they will actually feel a sense of restoration. You can garden with them, and they feel a sense of restoration. It is a way of processing the symptoms. Unfortunately, if you're working in field conservation and you walk out into a forest, the first thing we see that we've learned, this is a cognitively mediated trauma. I look at that and I say, oh my gosh, that's a system that's failing. I'm actually going to the, the trauma, the source of my trauma. So we have different recommendations about how we talk about this because it appears that social support is essential for those of us who are working in the conservation field. Now I bring this up because this study started when I was working at the Wildlife Conservation Society, and we had a new marketing team coming to visit. So if anyone's watching online and you're looking to do marketing, I'm just, this is a little bit of a useful story. Um, our new marketing team was coming, sitting around with people who are head of ornithological research and global research. This is the Wildlife Conservation Society. We've got 2,500 people working in 62 countries um, at, on different sites, and this is the company that's going to be marketing our global conservation strategy, and they brought us Dunkin' Donuts, Donuts and Coffee in styrofoam cups. Head of ornithology slams her hand on the table, they're still standing at the door, and says, these idiots can't ever understand us, I don't know why I'm here, I'm not wasting my time, and stormed out the door. And they're standing there, <laughs> shaking with their cups. And what I said was, well, you know, that was probably an error, you know, we really do have a program about styrofoam being a problem, and..." Uh, how it breaks down in the system, like this is probably not a good choice for you to show up with these cup of coffee. So I was chatting with a friend of mine who's a clinical psychologist, and he said, that seems a little out of the ordinary. That's, and I was like, oh, standard meeting in conservation. I don't know if you guys have these kind of meetings here, but um, certainly that was a WCS phenomenon, that they're very elevated emotionally. That's how we got into this study. We started looking at what are the real emotions and how do they play out. Um, so that kicked us off into dealing with this idea that we we walk around carrying this weight in our pocket about what's happening with the environmental system. And that can feel kind of lonely. So we tried to describe this as imagine our jobs if we really want to build a conservation-minded society. It's kind of like being a doctor working on a system. But your life and your future is dependent on the success of your operation. So with that, sorry, I explained the story of the pictures right there. Um, there we go. So this brings us to the last 10 years of work we've been doing, uh, studying this, so it's about two and a half years per letter. Um, this idea that hope is something that's really, how is it that we maintain hope? How is it that we keep going, given what's going on? This is where we believe the source, the capability lives in the opportunities in zoos and aquariums for all the stresses that people feel in their life. We know from one of the first waves of WZAM, the Why Zoos and Aquariums Matter study, uh, that was done by uh, another fellow that I work with, John Falk and Joe Heimlich, um, is they were looking at this issue of how do people think about the zoo and aquarium as a contemplative space. In fact, the aquarium is more contemplative. It's seen as a place that can fulfill some of our meditative goals, as well as some of our hobby, hobby goals or things we do with family. So when we think about conservation, it's important that we not assume that conservation itself is science. Okay? These are not equal things. Science is a path to understanding. It is a system for understanding what's going on by using an empirical data, an approach, that gives us tentative answers, and we get to then stand on the shoulders of who came before us and ask new questions and better questions and refine our understanding. But that isn't conservation. When we talk about conservation biology, it's really moving into a dimension that we consider to be moral decision making. Okay? We, don't, we know what's happening based on what we're doing. The science tells us the answer. 
It projects how it will play out, and it can even give you scenarios. But once you make a choice, you step away from science and move into the moral dimensions of priority setting. And that's a complicated idea, because when we talk about conservation, it's important that people understand the science. But is it as important that they have an understanding of how it fits in their moral code and values? So one of our early studies around 2007, we started to look at how people value zoos and aquariums. And we distinguished between the two because they are different. And so these numbers, actually we validated this last year and it hasn't really changed, so it's pretty stable. You'll see that there are people who value zoos and aquariums and you end up with this, um, you know, only useful as entertainment for children. I want to distinguish that between inhumane, okay? Some people discount it, but others don't necessarily discount it, but they don't feel anything negative about the zoo or the aquarium. Often those numbers are mixed. Um, so really we're talking 7% of our population that is anti-zoo, and the rest are willing to sort out how it fits in their life. So now I'm going to take you into the third wave of our studies. We've been focusing a lot on what happens to the individual, and I know you'll hear that when you talk about you know, what happens in a visit. And we've often done this bizarre thing that goes back to the sort of, if you really take the history, back to the French, the Descartes, you know, had this idea that you could just separate things and make them mechanical. And for some reason, in, in museum studies, we have this tradition of yanking someone out of a family group and chatting with them and giving them a test to find out how they did. We focus on the individual, but it's not necessarily how we're learning together. What we're learning is really part of a, a context. It's both a social group that we're with and it's the people that are around us. So we're learning together because we're either online together or we're sitting in this room together, but we're also going to chat with people later. And lastly, we don't do this alone. We are doing this in the context of our social world. So when we're broadcasting, reading, advertising, hearing about what your organization is doing as an aquarium before I show up and after I'm here, that's part of the learning experience. Talking in the car on the way home, especially for a family, if you can imagine how that's working, it's been a hectic day, two little kids in the back seat, they're exhausted after all the crying because they left, but you know what, they're happy and they're asleep, mom and dad suddenly start having a conversation about what happened, what they learned, what went on. So that whole experience is happening outside of the, the visit as well. And so we've developed this new model for looking at the zoo and aquarium experience as something that happens because you bring ideas with you. You come into a conversation at the zoo or the aquarium in the middle of a conversation. When I arrive, we've already talked about things, and we're going to do stuff that will drive that conversation. We're going to take some stories away, but we're going to start integrating it, especially when we read in the news, follow something online, or hear how we're debating what is the value of an aquarium in society today. And we're going to assign different criteria to what I'm expecting next time I come. So it's more cyclical. It's kind of a recycling, reusing model here. And that's the project we're working on. So what I'm going to be focusing on today is really this section of the third wave of studies that we're doing on the part that happens when you're not here, the integration and the assignment. This is where social stereotypes are set, how we talk about the experience before we come, and what that means to what we allow the legitimacy of the organization to have when I visit. So for us, perceptions shape the experience. We know that you come in with a belief and that belief is going to shape what is accepted and what I'm going to doubt or challenge. I'm learning how this works. So back again to some of the earlier studies from 2007, we were really happy to know zoos and aquariums are pretty trusted. We're actually specialty television channels like MSNBC and Fox um, are up there with us, which is kind of exciting. Um, environmental activists, interestingly, are less trusted than this top four group. What you'll notice is university scientists and researchers are not university administrators. The president of a university says something, goes, uh -huh. but if somebody is a scientist who studies it, they are constrained to that special area. What's interesting about the zoos and aquariums, zoos and aquariums are each given equally the ability to talk generally as a translator. They're not the scientific knowledge expert in the public's mind, they are the translator 
of those eggheads that are in universities. That was kind of the general. So neutral on trust, magazines, the internet, internet's kind of neutral, uh, newspapers, and guess who landed at the bottom of our spectrum here? Yeah, you got that one coming, right? Okay, no surprise. So, what good's an aquarium? <laughs> so we talked to parents and grandparents about what's going on in, in a zoo or an aquarium. Uh, we said, can you tell us, you know, they place high value on it. Um, again, it's about teaching. It's a resource for information. But when we really talk to them about why they bring people to the institution, it's not the science. It's the moral code. It's the family code. And I've heard a lot of folks who work in zoos and aquariums say, get upset when families say, oh, look, that's a mummy and that's a daddy. And it's like, well, actually, or that's a mummy and that's a baby. That's my favorite one. That's a mummy and that's a baby. No, that's a sexually dimorphous species. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> daddy is kind of little. Uh, but, but, you know, we get a little upset about that. But the interesting thing is I, what I did for this study, this was a total blast. I spent an entire day just walking around with a family and I did a whole series of families to see how they talked about their experience and I just followed them and listened to their conversations. And the function of the animal relationships in society were used to talk about code making, the codes of family conduct. What does it mean to be a good moral person, to protect one another, to be aware of what's going on, to be an, an adult nurturing a child, and what it meant to value these beings like us as an extension of our scope of justice. What we heard consistently was parents were using these models and grandparents were using these models to talk about what we now call in, what we call in psychology, an extension of scope of justice. Helping their care, the, those they're caring for, push the limits that they would consider, sorry, apparently I can't look that way. Um, pushing the limits of what they consider their scope of justice to include more. And that is a definitely an essential aspect. We talk a lot in zoos or aquariums about empathy. How do we promote empathy? But what we really are, f are seeing from parents is that empathy is a behavior that is important to demonstrate that you include entities within your scope of justice beyond yourself and being selfish. So this is about setting a moral code. When we talk to educators, they said science learning is what's going on. That's why we take field trips to the zoo. And that's one of the things that the aquarium does so well that I can't do in the classroom. So we then said to, to educators in formal in institutions, how do you explain this to the, the, the parents and the caregivers? They say, we're taking them on a science tour, trip to the aquarium. Great. And what are the parents hearing? You're snatching my moral lessons from my hands, and you're going to teach them your morals. That doesn't seem like something I want to happen. So we heard that there were two different stories being told about the purpose of the aquarium. The aquarium was, for the educator, a science learning opportunity, which seemed self-evident. But to the parent and grandparent, it was about establishing a moral code. Some will go along with it because it's part of their system. Others may feel some tension because they have different moral lessons they want to teach. So developing ways of talking about that tension is really about talking about a public perception that can encourage or discourage opportunities to get more kids to, a, to an aquarium with family as well as with the school. In fact, if you talk about the idea that both are important, then you're trying to tie the idea of a school visit with a family visit as something that is both science learning and moral development. So now here's something, you're going to memorize all this, right? Actually, keep your eye on, on the, the top left. Because when we asked people, do, you know, let's talk about science learning. What is learning? Now, so everybody, the code here, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, very big deal ever since it was named as a, as a field around 2001. And we said, what are the things that, that aquariums and zoos are doing to support STEM learning? This has been a big push federally, like we need more STEM education. And we heard from professionals that we pretty much do everything but linguistics. Thought that was funny. That was the only one that didn't show up in our surveys. Um, but then we talked to families and said, what do you think the aquarium is doing? And this is the number of things that came up. We don't do math, just so you know. 
No math, no math in the doors. Biomedical engineering, though, is a skill that people assign to the aquarium experience. Um, and some of the stuff doesn't come as a surprise. I think one of the things that I thought was really interesting was um, that as they were talking about, families were talking about life support systems. And I'm excited to say, by the way, you were a host site for one of our studies with members. So thank you so much for letting us use your property um, and talk to your members. Um, is that the idea of the technology that goes into building these places gives you substantial authority to talk about the needs of animals in the wild. It's an authority conveying thing. But as we get into moral decision making, there's another group here that's worth talking about. This is just a little bit of fun. I didn't interview this person, so I'm just gonna keep going. But I did interview a whole bunch of people at her level. Um, and, and we found that aquariums, zoos, not a surprise. They know they're popular. I love that the characterization of media magnet. Um, we know in a lot of civically owned facilities that showing up to give bad news about what you're doing in some other place, it's a great thing to do at the zoo or the aquarium. Um, but they are local. They are perceived as an arm of the community rather than part of a system. No surprise about these, so I'm going to just skip right over this one and jump to the one that freaks them out. Politicians are really, really, really uncomfortable because they recognize that the authority of the public voice that the zoo or the aquarium has as a translator of science information and a core trusted source. When you talk to an elected official whose funding includes supporting a zoo or aquarium, the director of that zoo or aquarium may work for them, but they recognize there is a power differential there, and they are petrified of anything that's going to be said about a policy they're putting in place that may be counter to the conservation mission the zoo is pursuing. The zoo has higher authority. And we're trusted, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we know we're trusted. So when we first did the study, we just looked at trust. Do you trust them? How favorable, you know, how, how much favor do you hold with zoos or aquariums? And you can see aquariums actually have a higher level of favorability with the public. This gets a little contentious when you start having big marine mammals. Just gonna say, the marine mammals make a difference, and the bigger they are, the more difference they make. Um, but our studies, you know, there were two studies going on that I'd like to show you. Um, these are contemporary studies using different wording. Okay, our numbers vary based on how we ask the words, and we've been tracking this for the last 10 years. Numbers are absolutely stable, by the way. Okay, so what we're seeing is favorability by 2013. We're still getting somewhat favorable. But what's interesting about this group, and this is where we started to focus our last round of studies, is in the somewhat favorable group, not the people who accept everything. We love the people who accept everything, but we recognize that if we're debating our moral authority and ability to talk about conservation, this is where the volatility lives in our market. So we looked at models of trust. And there are these two guys, uh, Caldwell and Clapham, uh, who came up with this idea of organizational trust because businesses were having difficulty questioning, like, do we trust Amazon? Do I trust them? Do I trust the company on the internet with my credit card information? Do I trust them? So they came up with this set of reasons why we trust corporations, okay? This is all business stuff. Um, and this is how any violation can lead to lower level of trust. They're independent, and that's how they're measured. So trust isn't a single thing. Trust is something we break apart. So we asked, how much importance, how does that trust work for, for aquariums and zoos? So we took the same set of questions, just to remind you they're there, and it turned out they didn't really work. Um, we had a whole different set. Once you introduce living beings, your rules of order change in terms of trust. Um, animals and animal rights are a key question here. What people wanted to know is this whole set, and we actually broke them into four categories. So it's a way of understanding where trust and trust violation occurs. And the issue of ethical integrity has to do with transparency. It has to do not only with are we consistent in the way we're acting, but are we also sharing all of our stories. Anything that is perceived to be concealing makes trust a little bit of a question. Now, in the conservation agency, what was really interesting here is how it maps to moral code. The idea of being a wildlife agent or an informant or activator. This is something we often talk about. We're doing field conservation. We're partnering with another group who's in the field. But what they're also expecting 
is that you're being given, you're sharing information on how they can be part of a community. It is perceived as a community dimension. So an organization that is saying, we do this by ourselves, does not achieve the same level of trust as an organization that says, we do this with others. We are a good social actor, we are a good community partner, we are acting altruistically. This dimension has to do with altruism. We don't act for ourselves, we act for our community. On behalf of our community, we do these things, we share this information with our community. Okay? They are looking for absolute advice on sustainability, and then you get your other measures that we've been doing a really good job of measuring. Did I enjoy my experience? Was it worth the cash? Um, we know that cost is definitely associated with favorability ratings, and we are suspecting that we are still collecting data right now to find out if some of the dimensions around trust are related to change in the economy and diminishment of real capital opportunity that people have in the United States. Um, it may be that declining, declining value of income, because people's incomes have been stable for the last 10 years, but the cost of living has increased, so people's buying power has dropped, and as prices have gone up on things, including visits to a leisure entertainment and venue, there may be a factor that's correlated there, so we're not getting all upset about this right now. We think there are some other bits to study. But the expectations and perception are, are part of the, the, the larger question of legitimacy. So when we ask people, how do you, much do you trust versus what do you perceive is going on? So to trust an organization, I'm going to rate something higher. And if we look at the difference between the little orange blocks and the green blocks, which I hope you can see if, you're not, if those colors aren't a problem for you, uh, trust is the one on top. So people would like our organizations to be trustworthy on each of these dimensions, and they need to hear it in order to feel that sense of trust. This is laying the foundation for perceived legitimacy in order to be able to make a conservation recommendation. So effectively, you're being assessed on these dimensions before I'm listening to you. I don't want to hear you until you explain, are you OK there? I want to believe you're there. The nice thing we hear in these studies, especially in the front end when we were talking to a lot of people, is they want to believe it. They just want a little bit of evidence to convince them they're right. But our difference between the two is a full step, a full stair step. And we're talking about 3,000 or 4,000 people in these surveys, so it's a pretty significant step but it's achievable because it's how we talk about the work we're doing. So now I want to talk a little bit about effectiveness. This is kind of fun, okay? So back around 2000, there's some big stress about polar bears. Polar bears used to be typified as a male combatant. They're often constructed like this in dioramas, individuals who are standing and frightening. And then a lot of work happened that started to feminize the story of polar bears. The idea of the isolation of a polar bear was really a feminine story, an issue that is more aligned in our language to caring and protection. It's a shift in narrative that makes the polar bear from a combatant male to a female that we see at risk that we need to include in our scope of justice. So that's been an exciting step forward. Unfortunately, they're awfully far away. So when we talk about things like threats, like climate change, we just know folks aren't talking, right? We look at what Yale did. Yale looked at who's talking about this stuff. They've been studying this for years, and they're finding that people just aren't chatting. So this is where I get a chance to talk about the work that's happening here. So a bunch of folks got together. You may recognize them. They run most of the countries in the world except one. Um, and they all agreed climate change is a problem. Got to deal with it. Got a Paris Agreement. We should go about and deal with that thing, right? Um, but when we look at what people say about climate change, we have this story in America that people are completely don't believe in climate change. Well, it turns out the numbers are actually completely different, right? This is sort of an exciting thing. People are actually pretty concerned. When you add up everybody that's here, you've already got the majority of our population, OK? So we've got a lot of people who are pretty freaked out, yet not talking about it. When we ask them what they think about their neighbors, they tell us their neighbors, and even scientists aren't as freaked out as they are. Now, when we ask scientists, guess what? The numbers look almost the same. <laughs> the public and the science community believe that there is this massive 
oversubscribing to the belief that climate change isn't happening. And really, these are the folks over here, these non-believers, they're the only ones who are saying, I adamantly deny the issue, okay? It's 4% of the US population. So there's a point where 8% of America thinks Elvis is still alive. So we've got some data on our side here, right? So, so welcome to the founding principles. <laughs> yes, we're better off than Elvis, and <laughs> um, we've been working with this organization called the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation. You guys are one of the founders. Welcome to the team. So I'm you know, telling some of you folks stuff you already know, because you've been there right from the start. We were the researchers working on it. It's the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation. We have an honorary food group called Gnocchi. Uh, comes in many flavors. <laughs> We hope you like it. You can learn how to not pronounce it. It's a very difficult thing to pronounce, especially in the American South. Um, Gnocchi works with an idea that there are ways of depoliticizing the story of climate change by very simply talking about it in, with metaphor. Remember what I said earlier about the metaphor and the aquarium metaphor? Well, here's another set of things that have to do with how we talk about climate change. You've probably heard them. I know that folks here have been using this through a lot of your programs. So it's not an, a surprise to see some of this language. But this language is tested for the ability for people to retain it and repeat it and talk about it in ways that make it very simple, right? It's very simple to understand. Our work on this project wasn't testing the metaphor. Our work was on testing how effective could this use of language by a community of organizations be it shifting the way Americans think about climate change. And so our model, which is very complicated, but it's got little fishies in it, you can see that. Um, we even have like symbols for all of our evaluation, was really about starting with a small group and radiating an idea out into the United States, into America, okay? Our concept, though, is based on the principle that if you're working in environmental education today, you're having a sense of you know, this is a difficult thing. It's very difficult to bring in this story to a public. So we suggested that instead of doing training programs where people go alone, what if we bring people in pairs and teach them how to talk to visitors and guests? But we realized that as we're doing this, we're building a community of groups, a community that's working toward a common goal about talking to their guests. But we recognize that it plays out because each of those groups is going to be sharing it with trainees, and this goes to the next tier, which is really sharing with their friends, their conservation colleagues, and from there, um, not only that is the way our story radiates out. So our story is no longer about an individual visitor. Our story in this network is about how we, as whole people who experience environmental change, who are trusted by our friends, our family, our colleagues working in kind, um, how much are we sharing information around this common language? So like Amway, we follow a pyramid scheme, except we're using language to get it to our community. This is the work that informs the visualizing change efforts that have been done here, working with your science on a sphere, and some of the stories you're hearing in this aquarium. Um, it's using this same structure to talk about our changing world in ways that can help people grapple with the simple concept and what they can do locally. What we've found is not only is this an, an effective way of teaching the story, but it has a great deal of efficiency to it. But the efficiency isn't found in the simplicity. It's in our social networks. So this is from that Visualizing Change project. It turned out to be, in our studies, one of the most compelling images near the end of, end of, a, project, end of a story, and I'm saying this partly because you might guess I'm getting near the end of my story, um, these are the connections on Facebook. We speak to the globe through Facebook. We have connections all over the place, and we know that people trust one another on Facebook, and that has been used to you know, improper ends by some folks, but we know that when you know the, other, the source, you are more accepting of what they're saying. So if we can start working in that network, and this is the community you're part of. Now, you can find yourself on this map, right? Um, this, this community of 184 institutions is using common language. Accounts for over 100 million visitors, okay? The numbers can get even bigger, but it's a 
that's kind of a lot of America, hearing these stories every day. So we studied the social networks, and this is my favorite. It's, this is the um, technical term, I think, is cat hairball. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is a social network analysis of all of the people who represent 184 institutions in this community. This is what's called an unbreakable community. Okay, There are ways in social network analysis where you can take these things apart and find weak links and take them out and say, ah, this network isn't working. This network's got problems. This network's really vulnerable. And this network is solid, powerful, resilient, and can handle the loss of a couple institutions without losing America. Now, this is the aquarium group, just to be clear. I'm pulling you out. And you are here. You are here. So you guys are in the center of the network, just so you know. You've got a lot of strong connections. Um, there are some, you're part of a larger community, and this is working. What we find is that people who are visiting these institutions are more likely to be exposed to stories about what they can do about climate change. They're starting to get activated. Um, what we know from our tests is a little bit of math, uh, but when we test it, we can see that the ability to talk about the issue, include the issue, do it in, your, do it in the institution, is leading to increased understanding. So we're developing that. We are finding that the people who are coming to these places are more civically active. They're the people who are voting. They're the people who are going out and talking to others. They're aware of some of these other topics. In all cases, this is a more literate community, more willing to share, more willing to vote, more willing to take action. And we see that the people who are doing this work have a greater sense of hope, a greater sense of community. They're energized. They are moving forward with the confidence that we as a community can change America's commitment to climate change irrespective of what we're hearing from the federal government. We know that this is happening. We are starting to see it in the voting patterns in the United States. If we want a conservation-minded community, the Gnocchi model that you guys are part of has demonstrated that we can build a conservation ethic in America, that we have the capacity to do that with the tools we have at our hands, that we can do it effectively in ways that motivate the public, to take action in that public is the motivated active public in our society. And with that, we as a community can help shape a new narrative in America that makes us a conservation country. We are a community. We are not alone the way the politicians see us. We work in hand in hand with our partners. And when we all speak of the same topic, we have the capacity to make America a strong conservation country. Thank you. How'd they do? <laughs> Love to have questions too, because I know. Yeah, so uh, questions, we have some time. No questions, you covered everything. Oh, Linda's in the back, she's got a microphone. Remember, we're, uh, we are live, so we'll use the microphones. Hi. Um, so I work with high school groups, and um, I one of the one of the things that I've seen in your earlier work of why zoos and aquariums matter is um, religious affiliations and things like that, and how how that can play into formulating opinions. Um, and perspectives and values and of why zoos and aquariums matter. And I know that's one of the deficiencies um, that we haven't done best to cater. And so what I've learned in my practice is that a lot of high school students, when I say, okay, you have to come to the aquarium and volunteer, um, a lot of them will say, oh, I have some sort of religious engagement that I have to do. And it obviously takes precedence. And so one of the things that I've noticed is that um, how, have we, how have we bridged that gap? I guess that's one of the things I want to notice, I, I want to find out is how we've bridged that gap um, where religion and, um, and science can meet. And not, not necessarily science, but values, and how we connect to those values more than more than anything. Well, I, I think um, it's, it's a difficult topic to walk. Um, yes, some of our research has shown that high, high degree of religious affiliation and attendance at 
church weekly. And by the way, being over 55 is part of the who funds the anti-zoo and anti-aquarium movement. That's where the funding comes from. And te teens are in that philosophical phase of life when things are really distinct. They have yes and no. Like you, everybody's probably heard from, from a you know, kid in their family, like you wouldn't know. Right? It's just, it's very distinct. Irony doesn't develop until it comes with the limbic system around your 20s. So, you know, in your late teens, like, you know, irony's not fun. It's just right or wrong. Um, but religious affinity is not necessarily against the story we're telling, especially when we're talking about this issue of moral, moral concern and moral consideration. Um, I, I know that some science um, training tells us that you can't have the two together. But we know that that's sort of a fallacy because they're different dimensions. And when we think about what we care for and how we steward, these are words that do align to many religions. There is a conservation ethic in most religions. And so, I mean, the real question is if you have a religious commitment for a teen, it's not about trading off the two. It's about saying they are convergent. And I appreciate that that's happening. And so I think that's what you're talking about with your work, that we have to find a place for convergence between beliefs and values. But if we really are going to steward this system, do we really need to debate the origin? Because the outcome is what we're really concerned about. And the protection of the diversity that we see around us in different religions, the real conversation is, can we find how the religion you're talking about, whether it's you know Buddhism, Islam, it, it doesn't matter. You know, uh, certainly if you're talking to people who come from the Hindu faith, the concept of protection is very much centered in that, that religion. So there are many ways into that story about finding convergence between the value systems because we think it's a moral concern. And the science is really helping us know where to put our effort and how to make good decisions, which is really what the code is. So that's sort of where I am. With teens, though, we have to recognize that there will always be the push between good or bad good or bad, and so we have to find a place to say it fits in the good bucket. Does that help? Did I answer? I am really looking, at, so I am hoping somewhere, a person with a big, thick wallet is online watching me. <laughs> <laughs> because our federal government does not really like us to do the work in the religion domain. Okay, so a lot of our funding has been federal. We would love to have some funding from a philanthropic organization because we do believe that this study of values is definitely something around moral code. And I would love to pursue that work. Um, we are looking for somebody because it's a deep dive and you have to rec recognize all the religions. In the first round of studies, which I think you're referring to, we actually did interview faith leaders from across the set world's seven major religions to talk about, uh, and leaders at the community scale, not the global scale. So Pope didn't answer the phone. Um, <laughs> so we, but we tried. But we did get like pretty far up there. <laughs> and, and all of them did have an alignment that could see the moral lessons that were central to the visit to the zoo or the aquarium. And, and I know when I worked at the Bronx Zoo, um, you know, I was at the Wildlife Conservation Society, so we also ran the New York Aquarium and a few other zoos. And on high holidays, you know, the religious groups and bus groups just crowded into the place. And I think a lot of zoos and aquariums around the country see this, that, that it's part of our faith tradition. So when we talk about it as only science learning, we're really not stretching to where our publics already are. That, I think, is, and so we'd love to take that further. That was the limit of that work. Hi, great talk. Thank Hello. you so much. Um, I'm a part of the aquarium team here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Thank you. And I just wanted to say, as aquariums and zoos look towards the future, um, you know, does your research suggest that there are better strategies for reaching people? For example, here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, we offer touch experiences. Uh, we offer animal encounters. We offer just beautiful exhibits with dive presentations, for example. Um, we even try to show off some of the great conservation projects that we're working on now. 
And I was just wondering if your research shows if there are more effective strategies than others in reaching out and um, sort of supporting that ocean stewardship. Um, I think what, what our research is suggesting is that we've got to move beyond the individual visit experience, that we need to be thinking across the life course about the multiple ways we will talk and touch people, um, that they are coming midway through a conversation, second, third, fourth time, we're building a relationship over time. We are meeting people quite often who know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who works here. Um, we know somebody who knows somebody who volunteers here. Um, that our social networks, our social community, and our online persona, the stories we tell about ourselves in the news, are all structuring how people come, visit a second time, visit a third time. And I think that that is really the trajectory we're suggesting from our research, that we need to do a lot more for building that affinity relationship and deepening how both the membership but also the repeat visitorship works, and also how we cross-pollinate with our peers and friends who work in the same domain so that our legitimacy and authority is something that they can use if they're working on an aligned program. So you say you're, you're talking about some of the work you're doing but are we really taking some of our members to another place? Are we starting to build those relationships in a way that we are seen as an effective social actor within our community? And I don't mean that like somebody from Hollywood. I mean uh, you know, someone who is taking action in a community on behalf of that community's values. So those relationships and those deeper relationship building efforts are the things that are playing off, uh, playing out well. Um, when I was at the Wildlife Conservation Society, one of the studies we did on membership found that it was seven years to convert a member from an economic member to an affinity member. And we developed the sort of hierarchy of how you go about developing that and culturing that sense of commitment to shared values. And so I think that as we consider ourselves as a social uh, convener, as a, a valuable part of the social fabric in the community, we move beyond the visit into the representation of our community's values. And I think that's kind of the shift we're starting to see. And we're starting to see where it's playing out well in some organizations that are doing it well. So, you know, people are playing with it. And I think for some of the larger institutions like the Aquarium of the Pacific, we're starting to see more and more of those behaviors. And I think you even see it in terms of who signed up for the, the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change interpretation. Their members are already asking for this information. They're actively interested in pursuing it. They're pleased to see that they're part of a, that this organization is part of a network. So those are the kind of things we're hearing, if that helps. So it's kind of like presenting that we are a community, not an individual, is, is part of our success story. And this is uh, maybe a, a sort of a counterpoint to that same question. When you were doing this research where you're following around families and seeing the discussions they have and, and all that, did you find any kind of common scenarios that popped up that were counterproductive or they created a sense of alienation where they sort of saw the, the zoo or the aquarium as, as something they didn't identify with or didn't want to participate in or had yeah. ideas or goals that they didn't want to relate to. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I did this with families from across the economic spectrum and certainly for the people who are living below poverty in New York City, um, there is definitely a perception of, you know, the elitist story can be like you pay and you pay and you pay and you pay and therefore I can't really afford to go but it's important to be here. Um, that, that concept that conservation is for the rich um, versus survival is, is a challenge that we continue to face because we're paid attractions. We don't work like libraries, so our, the narrative about libraries is different than what we have in a paid attraction. Um, other than that, not really. As I said, most of them still that issue of values. I mean, what I heard from some parents um, was, you know, we have to do this. This is like, although it's a real stretch to go and the cost of visiting is really beyond our limits, but if we don't do it, we're not gonna let them grow up right. So I didn't see a lot of the um, counterproductive, some of the, the, the short science stories, the misperception and naive knowledge because th in these visits, like because of my role as a researcher, I said I can't actually tell you anything about what's going on in here just for the day because I didn't wanna start becoming the information peddler. And um, that meant I did see a lot of the, you know, assumptions being made. Um, I'll say, because I also ran the interpretive programs at WCS, it gave me some, a good to-do list for fixing signage. Uh, <laughs> because some of the stuff 
if the sign had just been better structured and had a different headline and had a different set of sentences on it, we might have avoided some of the misperceptions because the reading wasn't going so far down into the story to understand some of the basic knowledge they needed. So there are some label studies that I could send you afterward that we did on how to hierarchically set up a label to simplify some of the, get over some of the naive mis misconceptions that are going on and proximity of labels and stuff like that. Uh, so that was really helpful for me as a zoo design person as opposed to zoo psychology person. Difficult to hear both hats on because you're like, oh really, oh really, geez, we've got to fix that, oh really. <laughs> so, so I think some of it is people want to make assumptions and they need the tools to do it. They don't want you to go too deep. The tools need to meet them where they're at. Um, certainly what I haven't seen, because when I was doing this, you know, no family that I was visiting with had, a, you know, we had a few families with smartphones, but that would be, you know, an adult that wasn't letting that thing out of their hands. And today, everybody's got access to whole different stories with their phones. So I think there are other techniques that we should be thinking about, going back to your question as well. Um, you know, recognizing the function of handheld technology is really sort of a whole domain we need to be pursuing a lot more aggressively because it's going to get used anyway and people will look up anything and even counter narratives and go to sites that have, I don't agree with that, so somebody's got to agree with me that I don't agree with that. So I think we need to think about those things. That helps. But I didn't hear a lot of it. I think I've also seen that a lot of that shows up for volunteers and educators because those stand out as the big clanging bell in the hallway, but the percentage is small. I think Emily had a question. Well, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to make a quick comment to add to Sandy and Luke's question, which also doesn't, it's not a question for you, but it does involve your work. Um, so our work here at the Aquarium of the Pacific and Climate Resilience is very much um, sort of rooted in all of that. It's no longer looking at the experience that people have inside of our walls, but rather our part in our community here in Long Beach. And, um, and so I think we're at the very beginning of that project. We're learning a lot. Um, and Nicole is working on that with us as well. Um, and we're just starting to figure out what, is the, what do those networks look like, right? And how can we elevate each other's work when we work together, um, when we think about challenges in lenses that not only involve um, science, but also like morals, right? So I think, I think, and values and things like that. So I just wanted to throw that out there that we're, we're starting that work with Johnny um, and, his, and his colleagues. So that's very exciting. This is like very new for us. Uh, for those online, Emily was pointing out my colleague, Nicole Lamarca, who's here uh, from our office in San Diego. Uh, but yeah, you guys are doing what we think is really pushing the limits of how zoos and aquariums think of themselves because the, the aquarium is a big anchor and a lot of the partners aren't so big. The aquarium has more public attention and legitimacy but may not be seen as acting as these small organizations who are doing this kind of community work are. Um, and that relationship, can, if it's seen as mutually supportive, can be incredibly powerful because they are partnering with a, a highly respected organization who has thinking about the big blue carpet and they're working on their micro piece and that concept of partnership is a whole different way of thinking about the function we serve in our societies and how we represent the community values. Um, I can tell you from some of the interviews I did with politicians in New York City that when they hear those kind of partnerships going on, that is a source of pride and support because they recognize that the community also is looking at those micro as well as the macro questions. So this plays out well in, poli in politics as well. We have one more. Oh. Hi, I'm... <laughs> I can barely see you back there, but I know you're there. <laughs> this is a, like a strange question, but is it possible that organizations like SeaWorld or uh, they might be damaging to like conversation, conservation? I mean, like with Dot Black, oh sorry, Documentaries like Blackfish might just push back public interest in aquariums because, you know, they think they were abusing them and mistreating them like all aquariums across the country and zoos. Um, well, they're, so SeaWorld is definitely aware of that and uh, I'm going to say I have done a little bit of work for them so I have to sort of admit that, um, though we haven't worked for them since 2012. Um, that said, blackfish was a problem. Um, it had a temporal blip 
in the, in the public data. We've been monitoring that as it occurred. Um, certainly anything that contains lies and misrepresentations or is put out by people who have lied to Congress is a problem. Um, lying is something that some Americans don't like. Um, and it's important that those of us who think lying is bad say lying is bad. Um, so I think that those are, when we look at the moral code and the moral values, that's the issue of transparency. If anything, Blackfish helped us recognize we need to be much more transparent, uh, certainly in the material that was put before Congress during that whole issue. Um, the ability to be transparent, direct, clear, and share the data to have the psychologists who work with these animals talking about what's going on is essential to rebuilding trust. And so it was a micro blip by a whole bunch of people who are trying to agitate. Uh, but again, when you use lies to achieve a goal, you may achieve a short-term goal, but you don't have the durability uh, because a lie can't sustain itself over a long period. So I think that I'm not as worried about it. I think the good news is because we are used by our visitors to think about moral decision-making and morality, the more we own that and recognize it, the more value we provide to our visitor. All right. Oh, Luke, you want the last one? Oh, good. Then I don't only have because to talk. we Go just ahead. came up and we were just we were just talking about it a little bit while you were lecturing. Um, ah. So <laughs> one thing. So you mentioned that a high value is a high thing that gives trust is people perceiving that we're treating the animals well and we're taking care of them. We've over the time of our communication here at the aquarium, we've always emphasized that and oftentimes put a lot of time into it. Um, and sometimes we've wondered, I've, we've wondered recently, are we putting too much time into it? Is it sort of like there's no cannibalism in the Royal Navy thing, like the old Monty Python sketch where they come out and deny this thing that no one's ever thought has happened before. And so do we have to talk about it? Or can people just see that we're doing a good job? They can't see it. Yeah. They can't see it. Because they don't have your expert eye. They, you know, they're looking for you to help them see with your eyes what you know. And so that, that is why you're such a good translator. It's why you're trusted to help them see it. So the more you use the evidence that you have to explain it, the more legitimacy you can then claim to talk about how we generalize that to a natural condition, an environmental system, or a, a behavior we want people to take in order to conserve the world. So you need to establish your legitimacy. You have to, and that is the basis of it. So people want to see through yours. It's why keeper talks are just you know, you still, they pack people in because these are the animal whisperers. They know the story. So, and, yeah. and not to, sorry, not a, no, I'm going to harp on just one, one more thing, though. So, but is it the, but by demonstrating empathy and care, is that, is that in and of itself enough? Do people know what it looks like? Yeah, if, if, the, if the behavior is being modeled, if it's obvious that this person caring for this animal loves and cares for the creature, is that enough? Do people see that? Um, Y'all need to be a little bit, you got to be literal, okay? When we do things, people think, you know, people think lions need lots of space. Lions need some space. Lions, when the food is delivered the same day at the same time, every time to the same place, they, you know, they are just like people watching TV at home. And if the potato chips and beer make it to the sofa, why would I go to the fridge? So, so you know, we've got to talk about what is fitness. What is emotional fitness? What does it look like? What are the evidence? Like, this is what we're talking about. We gotta be, the one thing I would say if we are gonna censor ourselves around anything, it's that we can get ourselves really fired up about the emotional negative story. And it's really easy because it's close to our hearts, it's close to our surface. And so um, one of the things I like to think about when we talk about conservation is if we can just think of it as like slapstick comedy instead of tragedy, we make a whole different story for our public because, you know, we just goofed up. I mean, we goofed up really badly. This whole climate thing, big goof up. But it's like, you know, it's like Keystone Cops. There were just a whole pile of us. And when we got together, we couldn't make it across the finish line. So we've just got to sort that out. But it, like we can admit that we just were silly. And that's OK because we can fix it. That's fixable. You know, and the good thing about comedy is it ends happy in the end. 
as opposed to tragedy when, you know, King Lear dies and we, you know, Desdemona keeps dying and dying and dying. And that's honestly what a lot of our conservation stories sound like, is like they're keeping in the back of your head, am I sounding like Desdemona or am I sounding like Charlie Chaplin? Like, let's try to, you know, Charlie Chaplin's very quiet. But <laughs> how, can we, how can we structure our story as a comedy rather than a tragedy is probably a better way of thinking about how we engage people in the story. And when I think about the work you're doing around engaging community organizations and working with community networks and members, it's really about the joy of supporting one another and having each other's back. And the reason we know that the Gnocchi model, the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation is working so well is that we've all got each other's backs and that has made us an unbreakable community. So I think I should probably shut up, right? No, thank you, thank you very going. much. Well, uh, you just given Luke his new idea for the next puppet show that he's gonna create. He's our theatrical programs uh, guy as well as uh, working on our show. So uh, thank you very much for doing that. It was a Thanks, wonderful Dave. presentation. I think he gave us a lot to think about. Thanks, Gary. Thank you all uh, for coming. So that's all the time we have. I, I just wanna uh, make sure everybody knows that you should join us again for uh, our lecture on August 14th with Gregory uh, Berard, hopefully I got that right, uh, here to discuss conservation of nautiluses in the deep sea uh, and the work to save the nautilus team. If you can't intend in person, remember you can always see us streaming live. Thanks a lot, guys, and we'll see you next time.